Laura, what is the point of the cave with respect to Plato's philosophy? What point is he making with this famous parable of the cave? And the world of forms is, where would you find that in his, in his parable? Okay, we're on the right track. Where is the world of the forms in the parable? The world of the forms is the, the, the outside world that they that's, goes out and sees. That's right. That's the world of the forms. What world do we live in, Nicole? World of forms. Do we live in the out in the sunshine? What point is Plato making? What's he point? What? Your question is unclear because we live. Like, in the parable. In the parable world. Like what, if our world. Were. <laughs> no, I, I mean, what, what world would Plato say we live in in terms of his parable? Where are we living? world that doesn't have the shadows. That's right. We live in the world of the shadows. It's where we all live. So, if I look at Avery, what am I actually seeing? According to Plato, I'm seeing what? <laughs> Trevor, what am I seeing when I look at Avery? According to Plato in his parable. Not a lot. <laughs> okay, yeah. Let's, let's, keep, let's keep personal, uh, you know. <laughs> you guys can settle that later outside. But what, according to Plato, am I seeing when I look at Avery? I'm seeing what? A shadow. A shadow. That's not real. That's no more real than the shadows that are cast upon a wall. I just see those shadows. I think they are real because that's all I've ever seen. I look at those shadows and I think, whoa, isn't that amazing? Look at that. And I think beautiful, this and that, sunsets and so on, all of that. It's just shadows. We are all trapped like slaves in this world of copies. The shadows are just the copies, right? Then... Uh, Jacob, somebody for whatever reason escapes. They escape from the world of shadows and are able to make it into the world of form somehow. And what's their experience when they first arrive in this world of the forms? Well, they initially they don't understand that what they're seeing is the same thing as the hard to make connections, you know, and they've never seen anything like it, so it's, I, don't, I mean, I don't know exactly what you're asking. But no, it's their experiences, they're dazzled by it, they're confused by it, you know. Who is the person? I mean, symbolically, who is this person who escapes from the cave and is ushered into the world of the forms? Plato would say that person is who? Josiah. He would give that person a name. That person is a, a philosopher. philosopher. The philosophers are the ones who can escape from the cave through the exercise of their mind. They rise above this world of shadows. And at first they're dazzled by it. It's blinding. But then they begin to see things. They begin to see the, you know, the, the reality is not shadows on the wall. These are the real objects. And after a while, the philosopher becomes comfortable living in this wonderful world of just seeing these sort of these rational realities that are there in the mind. And the philosopher thinks to himself, I need to do something about this. What does the philosopher, Sarah? feel like he needs to do once he's experienced all of these wonderful visions of the ideal world. He needs to come back and explain them to the audience. 
That's right. And how is he received, Kaylee, when he comes back in? They don't recognize him. That's right. He seems like this kind of ranting idiot. And he's trying to explain to them. And they did this nicely on the little video. <laughs> People are going, what is this guy? Get out of here. And that's how Plato felt. He felt that he was finally seeing the reality behind all of these shadows, and he was trying to communicate them to the people of Athens, trying to communicate them to his contemporaries, and they just treating him like an idiot. Now, that's not really quite true. He was given quite a bit of respect, you know, and uh, so he was, he was treated better than his character in the parable was treated, but that's how he still felt. He felt like so many people were disregarding him as they had Socrates, abusing, putting to death these who he views as their saviors. You know, yeah. Would Plato have said there was, like, once somebody became a philosopher, do you say there's, like, a physical difference in the world, or is it just, like, it's just kind of like a different way of looking at the world, kind of? It is a different way of looking in the world in this sense that you all of a sudden realize that what you thought was real isn't. So there wouldn't be, like, any difference between the normal person, like, looking at a tree and a philosopher, except for, like, because I was wondering, like, you know, in the, his uh, the cave, analogy, like once the slave goes out into the real world, oh, uh, uh, the prisoner goes out into the real world, there's like an actual difference in what he sees kind of, mm -hmm. you know, like rather than the shadows, but yeah. Plato didn't think that like philosophers literally saw things He's, well, he's a rationalist, and so he believes you see, this, see it through the eye of your mind. You see it through philosophical reflection. You don't see it, I mean, I look out the window and I see a tree. Okay. Well, if Plato were standing here, he would look out the window and he would see a tree. But Plato would say that because he has seen the world of absolute treeness, he realizes that that's just a shadow. So his judgment about the tree is different, even though he sees the same tree I do. I would liken it, if I were to do my own little parable, it probably wouldn't be quite as good as Plato's, but I would say, you know, when I was a kid, I loved stuff with bright colors, little boxes, little blocks that were bright red. I thought that's what made the world go round, was these little, I'm talking about when I was a real little kid, like 16 years old, you know. I would play with these little, little blocks with A on one side and B on the other, you know, and I thought, this is the stuff of life, and I was so excited. You know. And then I became older, a little more mature, and I realized that even though I had once valued those blocks so much, now, to be honest with you, Sarah, I can't remember the last time I played with those blocks, you know? It's been a while, I, two, three weeks now, I haven't done, <laughs> you know? Because you, you finally reach a point where your judgment about the value of that thing has changed. You see that, Stephen? The block is still the same. You as an adult see it the same as a two-year-old kid. But, but you're, you think, oh, it's a block, and you leave it alone. And the two-year-old kid is just you know, really excited about it. That's kind of what Plato is saying happens to us. We somehow experience a level of reality that makes this whole world look like it's just a bunch of little playthings of no great consequence. You know. Never going to satisfy. Never going to meet your deepest you know, need. Again, he sounds a little like a Christian because Christians say things like that. We look at a world in which people are passionately chasing everything you can imagine, believing all the TV's commercials, that if you just buy this, own that, go here, do that, you know, you're going to be happy. And we see people chasing all this stuff and we think to ourselves, oh, that's so sad. Because we realize that even though you accumulate all this stuff, you're still as empty at the end of the day as you were at the beginning. It didn't satisfy. And somehow Plato was onto that. He figured that out. That it's all just a bunch of little tinsel and tin. And there's a reality that really makes life much more meaningful. And when he talks about this, it's quite stunning. Really, he does sound a lot like a Christian at points as he discusses some of this. All right. Out of this comes what's uh, generally regarded as a it's kind of a uh, well-known image, this uh, pyramid 
uh, Plato in which he distinguishes three different levels of reality. The lowest level is the level of the copies or the shadows. This is where most people live. Most people live just fascinated with things that are paper thin, unreal, unsatisfying, but the vast majority of folks are just living at that level. And you try to tell them there's something else to life, they just, pfft. you sound to them like the philosopher in the cave. <laughs> Reality, heaven, get out of here. You know. It just falls on deaf ears. But that's where most people live. Then he says there is a higher level, and this is what he calls the world of the forms. And this is the world that you experience when you go outside the cave, using the parable. And, you know, at first, you're dazzled by everything. It's blinding. I mean, you've all had that experience, you know, of being inside on a Saturday morning watching Saturday morning cartoons, you know, or whatever. And then you decide, hey, I think I'll go out and do something kind of fun. I think I'll go out and play baseball in the park or whatever. And uh, so you walk outside, and it's a bright, sunny day, and you've been sitting in this kind of closed room all morning, and at first, your eyes are dazzled, and you can't hardly see anything. You've all had that experience, right? And then after a while, your eyes adjust, and you begin to see the world outside. You see trees and, you know, barking dogs and cars and fences and so on. And all of those things that you see is what Plato calls the world of the forms. And even that is dazzling to us at the beginning, just like the guy coming out of the cave. There's all kinds of stuff to see. We don't see any of it for a while. You have to kind of adjust your psychological equipment to recognize. And not everybody can do it. Most people are wired as slaves. In Plato's world, most people are wired as slaves. They will not and they cannot get out of the cave. They want to stay there. They prefer shadows to reality. See, But some people are the philosophers. Are you a philosopher? If Plato were standing here, he'd be asking that question. Or are you just a slave? What kind of person are you? Are you willing to risk getting out of the cave? Well, if you do, you're at first going to be dazzled by all this stuff. But eventually, your eyes will adjust. But even when you're outside the cave, what is the one thing your eyes will never quite adjust to, Sydney? What's the one thing that you can never quite just focus on, even when you're outside the cave and even when your eyes have adjusted, the one thing you can't really look at very much is what? The sun. The sun. This is what he calls the highest good. And in the parable, it would be the sun. And you know that. On a bright, sunny day, no matter how long you've been outside, you, take, you, know, you just stand and stare at the sun for a while, you're going to be in trouble. You can burn a hole right through your retina. You, know, you do that, and, and, um, and Plato is aware of that. For Plato, we would like, as Christians, we would like for Plato to then kind of draw this necessary conclusion. We'd like for him to take the step that is implied by his philosophy. Here he is, he's painted this picture, and now he talks about this highest good, which is dazzling, which is so dazzling you cannot even look at it directly. It completely blinds us. It is so overwhelming, and we want to say this great, wonderful, high reality that just exceeds everything else would be what? What would we like for him to say that is, Kayla? You know, we expect him to say, as Christians, we think he's going to say, and that is? The light. The light. Well, he said it's the light, but what we want him to say as Christians is that it is? 
Matthew? The heavens. the heavens. A little more precise, please. It is? Come on, this is an easy question. What? Thank you. Yes, it is Sunday school, and that is the right answer. So, uh, you know, that's what we want as Christians. We want Plato to take the last step. He's, he's, his reasoning here all the way through has been pleasing to us. We think, yeah, Plato, you're getting the right answers here. And then we want him to say, and then there's finally this great reality of God who is holy and majestic, and he's so lofty and transcendent. We can't even look at this one directly. No one has seen God and can live to survive it. You know, That would be a biblical idea. Plato never gets there. Plato has a God, but this isn't it. His God is a much lesser being. But what Plato does call this is simply the good. And what's sometimes confusing if you study Plato as a Christian is that when Plato begins to describe the good, you would think for all the world it was a Christian theologian describing God. You see. Because he speaks in terms of a beatific vision. And the language that he uses is powerful stuff. And you could read it devotionally. So what does Plato have for a god? Uh, Plato's god is a character that is called philosophically a demiurge. Anybody ever heard the term demiurge? Is that a brand new term? Or have you heard of that before? Sometimes it pops up brand new. Have you heard that? Do you have any idea what that would be? Okay. Get this word. You need to know it. Um, so Plato does not identify his god, this demiurge, with the highest good. That is, but this is the pinnacle of his philosophy. This is, you know, this is the point that gets people kind of juiced up. He does have a so-called creation myth. The creation myth is found in one of his later dialogues called the Timaeus. And in this, he talks about his view of how creation came to be. And at this, he introduces this sometimes called Plato's God, uh, which is a demiurge. A demiurge is simply a word that means a fashioner or a fabricator, somebody that takes something and fashions it into something else, like a, like a sculptor or a potter. So a demiurge is someone who takes pre-existing stuff and fashions it. And for Plato, that's what, the, that's what God is. He's creator in the sense that he's creating some pre-existing stuff into this world in which we live. And he kind of uh, describes it sort of like making a cake. So if you're going to make a cake, you need some things. Megan, if you're going to make a cake, tell you what, what would be one thing you would need? Or one kind of, well, I'll just ask it like that. You've made a cake in your life, right? So if you're going to make a cake, if we said, okay, Megan's going to make a cake in class today, and she needs all the necessary stuff, what would be one thing you would need or one kind of thing you would need? All right, you, you would need ingredients. All right, so we'll put all of those together. So you need ingredients. You need the stuff of which this cake is going to be made. And Plato calls that matter. The demiurge does not create the matter. The demiurge always ha already has the matter there to work with. Just as if you're going to make a cake, Megan, you don't actually wave a magic wand and have all of the ingredients, you know, flour and baking powder and all that. It doesn't just occur out of magic, right? You go down to the store, you get it. It's pre-existing. All right, very good. Good. What else are you going to need? What besides the matter? Okay. You're going to need. Um, you're going to need tools. You're, uh, what I what 
portfolio calls this is you're going to need, um, well, let's call it, let's put all the tools together as one thing and call it a vessel, a bowl. You need a mixing bowl. All right. You need to make the cake in something. And we're going to include with that a spoon or a, what do you call those things that you? Spatula. Spatula. What did you say? A whisk. A whisk. <laughs> that. That's too high tech for me. Um, mixer, you know, a mixer, it kind of turns and, all right. The egg beater, that's what I was after. All right. This is what Plato calls the receptacle. And so when you hear in Plato's philosophy of the receptacle world, that's where he gets that word. This is the world that we live in. It's the world of the mixing bowl, right? What else do you need? Let's see. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll just take a wild guess then. What else would you need? You've got ingredients. You've got a mixing bowl. What else do you need? You just throw all this stuff together. Yeah, well, we're going to make that part of the bowl. Um, you just throw the stuff together randomly. Just throwing some flour, throwing some. What do you need? You need a recipe. a recipe. Thank you. For Plato, the recipe is the forms. The demiurge creates the world using forms that are found at the level of, the, at the ideal level. All right, and then the last thing is the demiurge himself. This is the cook. So this is, uh, this is what Plato, his, this is his creation myth. He's not teaching anything in particular at this point, but he simply wants to philosophically account for creation and he imagines that there is this being that has assembled everything and produced the world in which we live and that's what he calls God. That's Plato's God. But don't confuse that with this much more lofty, but rather, imp well, I erased it, this rather lofty but impersonal thing which is the good. And in some ways, from a Christian point of view, the good has a whole lot more in common with our God than does this demiurge, which is a much lesser being. Go ahead. So does the demiurge kind of fit in with the world of the forms? Is he kind of like this ideal being? Or? Think of it this way. The demiurge knows the world of the forms and uses the world of the forms as a pattern to create the world in which we live, okay? Yeah. Are you gonna, I heard that C.S. Lewis was a neoplatonist. Is that different from the Platonist? Yeah, it is, and uh, there are, uh, C.S. Lewis, the term neoplatonism is a broad term that is used to paint with a broad brush with respect to a lot of people, and in the broad sense, uh, you know, Certainly, Lewis would be, and many others. But don't uh, don't push that too hard because um, that can be misleading. So, and hopefully, we can talk more about that if you'd like to. Uh, but probably not today because time is up. Arrivederci.